Oh hi, Mark Pearson, Executive and Artistic Director of the College Light Opera Company, coming to you from the library at Highfield Hall. Welcome to On the Clock, our weekly lecture series. On the Clock is made possible through our partnership with Highfield Hall and a generous grant from the Woods Hole Foundation. This week, music director and conductor Liz Hastings is here to talk to us about that American tradition, Summerstock Theatre. Let's hear what she has to say. I've got a barn. That's the traditional response to, hey kids, let's put on a show. Clock has a barn, what more could you need? I'm gonna speak about the factors involved in choosing a show to produce, how to ensure that that choice is a practical one, and the challenges in getting a show on the boards. Disclaimer, everything I'm talking about refers to pre-pandemic reality. When we come through this, theater will be a totally different animal again. Uh, we'll, we'll be doing many things very differently in order to make live theater viable and safe. Uh, if it were only as simple as saying, hey, let's do Wicked next season, great, we could open the season with Phantom of the Opera and follow it with something traditional like the Mikado. Well, in case you've been under a rock, under the present circumstances, perhaps you have been under a rock. Um, Wicked presents challenges usually considered beyond the scope of theater in a barn. And when Broadway figures out how to come back, Phantom is going to figure out a way to be on it. And Mikado has not been traditional for some time. Clock. In case you need a refresher, let me explain what sets clock up apart from the real world. With the exception of the first show, which gets a luxurious extra week, um, each show is given about 30 hours of rehearsal leading up to tech rehearsal on Sunday night and dress rehearsal on Monday night. Monday day is reserved to review, repair, and run. Run! Magic Monday. At clock, Time is of the essence and efficiency is the goal. Uh, if you're trying to accomplish something in a rehearsal, uh, don't take a whole sentence to say it if you can do it in two words. Don't use two words if you can do it in one and if you can accomplish it with a raised eyebrow, even better. There is no room in the schedule for extra time because the show is in trouble. There is no extra time and there can be no trouble. In addition to the orchestra of 18 or 19 players, there are 32 people in the vocal company forming a finite talent pool from which all roles must be cast. By design, age-appropriate casting is not an option. Uh, all roles, be they uh, characters from 9 to 90, are played by the vocal company. With the occasional exception of bringing in kids. Kids. For shows like Oliver, Music Man, or Sound of Music, all the roles are performed by the members of the vocal company. At clock, Mr. Lundy is eternally 20 years old, unless you come back in 100 years and he'll have turned 21. Roles. Oh, we're talking about the vocal company. What are the demands of your show? Roles. Are there more than 32 parts? Um, it's a problem, but it can be solved with some judicious double casting, giving more than one role to one person. Densely populated shows like Candide, Titanic, or Wonderful Town um, come to mind, and those problems have been solved. You've got to do it in advance. Uh, what, while some of these parts are tiny, you have to figure out ahead of schedule who can double on what so that you avoid things like, I can't run in on that line, I'm still on stage, dead. Or, I just, I just exited stage left, I don't have time to come around stage right to be the other guy. Or I don't have time to get out of the gorilla suit and become the mayor. Are there too few parts? It's also a problem. There are some really wonderful shows that were just not conceived to show off the talents of a company like Clot, which is based on its GNS origins. Chorus. Big choruses? That's a problem. Um, despite the fact that there are 32 people, you, you never, you rarely get a chorus of 32 except for, you know, end, ends of acts and finales. Um, 
remember that quite a few of them are playing characters who don't necessarily sing with the chorus. After the parts are assigned, you've probably got yourself a large magical group to function as the chorus. Plus, people have different tasks in the show. So your 32 people are all doing scenes and involved in choreography. They're not just sitting around waiting to review their chorus music. A lot of choruses, this is also a problem. Um, these take time to teach and drill. Your finite talent pool is busy in dance rehearsals and, and scenes. Um, still, they have more to do than simply review chorus music all week. I think I said that already, but I'm going to keep going. I wasn't there, but I am told that um, shoehorning the choruses and Gypsy Baron into the schedule was kind of a nightmare, and they, they just made it. Dance. Is it a dance-heavy show? Remember that the clock company is assembled on the basis of varied uh, talents. Some are stronger uh, in, as vocalists, some are stronger as actors, although they all have dance background. While I was writing this paragraph, I Googled dance heavy Broadway shows and was blown away by how many of them have actually been done at clock and done very well. So I was trying to make some point about dance and dance shows and then ne ne never mind. Selecting a show. In the best of all possible worlds, your show is a big hit with your audience. Your audience. What is the demographic? Who are they? What do they want to see? Year rounders are very supportive. Um, they can reel off a list of their favorite clock performers. They'll tell you the shows that they loved. They'll tell you the shows that they hated. They will remember clock and their will. Tourists. Um, they can't be counted on for, for repeat visits, but hopefully they go home and tell their friends who are coming up to the Cape next year about clock. They're also the reason there are um, all those items, those things on the internet and glossy brochures that say all those nice things about the company. Seniors want to see the show the way they saw it in 1958. Their grandchildren probably don't want to see anything. Surprise them. They are your audience of the future. You have a show in mind. Does it have any un-PC un -PC issues? that will be difficult to overcome. Annie, get your gun, carousel, kiss me Kate, all come to mind. There are other problem shows and the list grows daily as hot button issues come to the forefront. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink is no longer sufficient to um, dismiss sexism, racism, or misogyny in theatrical works. Everything rightfully is under scrutiny. Does the casting present challenges? The Color Purple, Flower Drum Song, and Once on This Island, to name a few, are stunning shows, but the casting involves, well, the elephant in the room. Does the show present extravagant technical challenges that if unmet will leave your audience feeling shortchanged? Flying things, people, magic carpets, helicopters, Special effects, rain, fire, sinking ocean liners, creatures, giant apes, man-eating plants, singing reindeer. You got to know what you're getting yourself into. Tech stuff. This brings us to scenic and lighting, de scenic and lighting design. Your designers are more important than ever before because your audience expectations are higher than ever before. Like the shows they see, your audience has been Disneyfied. They go to a show truly expecting to see the magic of theater. Will you be able to deliver? Your show does not have to be a slick, high-tech operation, but it will help if you can pull off something so clever and so charming that they they're talking about it for weeks and weeks, and it's memorable in its own right. Sets. Most opera writers call for two or possibly three sets. They're stationary, they get changed during intermission, and then sit there for the next act. Low tech, 
in that regard. The Golden Age shows, like a lot of the Rogers and Hammerstein, Lerner and Lowe, Cole Porter shows, have, and I'm totally making this number up, but somewhere between five to 12 scenes per act. Priorities changed in the mid 60s, moving away from the big realistic shows with things like the Harmonia Gardens, real nice clam bakes and Baghdad. Shows began to be designed with economy and fluidity in mind. More could be implied with less and the audience was happy to connect the dots. Think about it, even a show as big as Sweeney Todd, which is a massive show, was crafted for efficiency, grace, and economy. Does your show require a lot of scene changes? Can it be accomplished by a few wagons or items that come on and off and help take us from place to place? What sort of set best serves your show? Does it have to be realistic? Do you want your production, um, do you want your opening of Brigadoon to be filled with lush greenery? Will your ship and new moon have exquisite rigging? Does Henry Higgins study need to be cluttered with all sorts of paraphernalia and comfy couches and doilies? Um, hell, does your set have walls? Could you suggest different locations by a few defining items? Candide, which takes us to at least seven countries during the course of the evening, begs to be designed by implication. Bear in mind that this set will share the calendar with the eight other shows. It has to be constructed in specific, finite, I keep coming back to that word, finite, uh, a finite amount of time. Can your designer put something together that can not only, only be built efficiently, but is, it, but is easy to move on and off without requiring a large crew? Aha. Uh -huh. If cast members are responsible in the scene shifts, remember that they do not meet the set until Sunday night. There is no time in the schedule for something that requires hours of rehearsal just to routine the getting on and off. In the interest of keeping the flow, the composer often re provides music to accompany the set changes. It may punctuate the scene that just ended or anticipate the mood of the scene that's coming up. If you're given 24 bars of music, this should tell you that you are not expected to construct a pajama factory just make us think about a pajama factory. Your brilliant lighting designer can only be as brilliant as their best piece of equipment. I'm sort of making that up, maybe a little simplistic, but be, uh, barring the occasional rental of a special specialty item, be aware of what you have and what can, what can do and what it can't do. Costumes. What sort of costumes are needed? Is this a show that Clock has done a lot? There's probably an entire set of costumes ready to be pulled. Um, make sure it's checked early in the game to see if it needs any TLC. Is this an old show that warrants a new production with, with new costumes? Check the calendar. If you can avoid scheduling new shows or big shows back to back that require a zillion costume fittings your costume designer and crew will be grateful. Is there anything out of the ordinary in any department that you must have? This should be communicated to whomever early in the game. Don't choose a show that is impractical and beyond your budget. Duh, I'll drink to that. Is the show available? What does that mean? Public domain, um, at the risk of way oversimplifying, there are three things you need to put on a show. A script, a score, and orchestra parts. This from the web. The term public domain refers to creative materials that are not protected by intellectual property laws, such as copyright, trademark, or patent laws. The public owns these works, not an individual author or artist. Anyone can use a public domain work without obtaining permission, but no one can ever own it. If your show is in the public domain, it means if you can get your hands on a score and script, you're two thirds of the way there. 
uh, with a, a generous offering to the photocopying gods, you're in pretty good shape. You may be able to go online and buy orchestra parts off the rack. You may even find them in your public library. The GNS shows, for example, are all public domain. And I didn't, I hadn't done the math, but I learned every work first published before 1923 has been in the American public domain since 1998. Doing a work in public domain makes at least one element of your show relatively inexpensive. Uh, that's why it's, it's helpful to have one or two public domain shows in your season. While you may wish to build your lib music library with scores and orchestra parts, um, they are often rental only. This is where more red tape and fees come in. Which leads us to our next topic, licensing fees. If a show is not in the public domain, you will be charged a fee to obtain the legal rights to produce it. Without paying such a fee, you cannot legally access the score and the script. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that this will be true of most of the shows that make up a clock season. A show may be licensed by various organizations like the Gershwin Estate, Rogers and Hammerstein Organization, the Court File Foundation, Music Theater International, Tams Whitmark. Um, if a show is currently on Broadway, about to go on Broadway, or on a national tour, it is very unlikely that you will get the rights to that show. Uh, especially if your venue is geographically close to New York. Often the amount of the fee will depend on factors such as um, the number of seats in your house, the number of players in the audience, number of performances, and your ticket prices. Whatever the fee is, you will think it is too much. It is. Another possible fee, the European operators. Lehar, Kalman, uh, Johann, <laughs> not Richard Strauss, that's a whole other company. Lehar, Kalman, Johann Strauss were written to be sung in European. Assuming you want to perform your show in English, you want, you're going to want a good English translation. If you find one that you want to use, be prepared to pay something for it. Like so many special interest groups, operetta circles are very close-knit. Um, they all want to know who's doing what. They will find you. By the way, you might be asked to pay to use the translation that's in your handy-dandy downloadable piano vocal score. Go figure. <clears throat> Three anecdotes. Merry Widow. I wanted to do it on the up and up, and I remember correctly that although they knew we were doing the show with piano, the publisher insisted on sending us a complete set of orchestra parts, um, which sat in the box until we finished our show, and then we had to pay to ship them back. Chocolate Soldier. Although I had f the photocopied material, don't ask. I had the photocopied material in my hands before we started rehearsal. Again, I wanted to do the show on the up and up. It took me a while to track down the, pub, the, the I guess, I can't remember if it was actually published, publisher and translator, um, so I could pay them. By the time we found them, they told me rather obnoxiously that we had performed an illegal production of Chocolate Soldier. Flater Mouse, I could not find anyone that wanted to take our money. G. Shermer on the East Coast sent me to G. Shermer on the West Coast. G. Shermer on the West Coast sent me back to the East Coast. Nobody wanted to deal with this, and we finally all gave up, and we got a free translation. Whoopee! So many things have changed with the advent of the internet. Back in the day, people used to earnestly mail out, remember mail? mail out flyers to their sisters, cousins, and aunts in the hope of getting a decent sized orchestra for their show. Now by hitting send, within minutes, thousands of people who you never met know that you're performing Sheila and Hair. Woe to you if you didn't want your Aunt Mabel to find out. Rental agreements. Rental agreements have uh, clauses, often have clauses that prohibit cuts, script changes, and more. Here is an actual snippet of one such contract. This agreement does not authorize or permit any use of the work not expressly set forth herein, 
and does not include the right to alter the fundamental character of the work. Without limiting the foregoing, no arrangements, transcriptions, or alterations, amendments, modifications, interpolations of other works, deletions to the work, or to the libretto of the work may be made without express advance written permission. Which brings us to cuts. There are a lot of reasons why you may want to make cuts. The show just feels too long for summer fair. You don't have the time or personnel to stage the ballet in act three. Some of the dialogue is wordy, creaky, cringeworthy, or all three. You feel you could deliver a tighter, more polished show if there were just less of it. If you feel you must make cuts, you have two choices. Throw yourself at the mercy of the licensing agent and hope that they don't turn you down because then you're stuck. Or throw caution to the wind and hope they don't find out that your My Fair Lady ends 20 minutes earlier than it's supposed to. Um, the licensing agent requires specific wording for, in your program to explain the agreement with, with the licensing agent. That was a little bit, let me read this. The licensing agent requires specific wording for your printed program regarding the agreement. Um, these organizations have stipulations regarding video and audio recording. Be careful about bending the rules. You do risk a fine. It goes on your permanent record. These folks often require uh, two tickets as part of the rental agreement. It is not unheard of for a representative of the agency to turn up in your audience. Besides, who doesn't want to go see a show in a barn on Cape Cod? Now I'm going to digress a little bit. Conductor and director. It helps when your conductor and director are a compatible congenial cooperative pair who are on the same wa wavelength with regard to the show. Ideally, they both want to coax your best performance out of you. It makes them look good. Kidding. Not kidding. The stage director. When directors open the script, they see in print time, place, scenic design, everyone's lines in the show, and stage directions. Wouldn't it be fun to just hand out scripts to everyone and let people invent a show? Hell yeah. But in truth, it is usually more efficient to assign that role to a stage director. Um, someone to be in charge of things, someone with a sense of the arc of the story, who has made choices regarding the feel and style of the show and communicated that to the production team and the performers. Someone who can communicate to the, uh, just said that, at the most primitive level, someone needs to make sure that all the actors are performing the same show and that the inmates simply haven't taken over the asylum. The director synthesizes all that print and the script and takes the story from page to stage. The conductor. Easy peasy, open the book, wave your arms in the proper patterns. And um, what Richard Strauss said, never look encouragingly at the brass. My guys and dolls will sound recognizably like your guys and dolls, right? Let's fast forward. The show has been meticulously rehearsed and is now in performance. So much of the conductor's work is in the moment Yes, the conductor set the t sets the tempo, but is responsible for the pacing, the color, and the spirit of the show. He's, oh my God, I said he's, the conductor. Very fluid, the conductor, I'm mortified, uh, is also responsible for responding to the sound at all times and making adjustments where needed. Coax, remind, prevent, and the conductor does not get to go home after open night. 
Both jobs require an extraordinary amount of preparation, collaboration, and communication. Patience and humor go a long way to keep the performers focused and committed. If this team suffers from infectious enthusiasm, it might be contagious. Now some vocabulary. Instrumentation, orchestration, arranger, pit, reduction, orchestra score, piano vocal score, conductor score. I think of instrumentation as the checklist of the particular instruments used in a piece of music or the manner in which the piece is arranged for those instruments. Excuse me. A composer, or just as likely the arranger, might want to include the colors of the harp and xylophone, but not saxophones or tuba. Orchestration can mean the same thing, but it can also mean the act of actually writing those notes for those instruments. Uh, making this line an oboe solo, giving this to brass choir, um, or assigning this section to marimba. Let us assume that the piece of music exists in some form or shorthand before the orchestrator or arranger starts their task. Um, the arranger, by the way, can take the work of the orchestrator and, and rearrange their work. Uh, let's say reorchestrating or arranging Climb Every Mountain for string quartet instead of full orchestra. That might be something an arranger would do. It is the instrumentation and the way a show is orchestrated that make Anything Goes sound different from Fiddler on the Roof or Secret Garden. The pit. The pit can refer to the actual orchestra pit. It can also mean those players and what instruments they play. What is the pit for your show? Meaning who play, how many who plays what instruments? Orchestra score versus conductor score. A proper orchestra score for something like Marriage of Figaro is a, a complete set, a roadmap, if you will, of everyone's part in the entire four hour opera. Your second horn player can say, um, do I have a G or B flat in measure 34? And you can look in the partitura or conductor score. Nope, orchestra score, I'm ahead of myself. Partitura, orchestra score. Um, you can look in the orchestra score otherwise called a partitura, and give them the answer. With the exception of the GNS and a few operettas, um, there are no orchestra scores for most of these shows, not proper full orchestra scores. Uh, I think it may be changing because the technology has kind of caught up, caught up with itself. Uh, it is now possible to take all those orchestra parts and make an orchestra score out of them. Um, a piano vocal score is what the rehearsal pianist plays from. It has all the vocal lines over a piano part. It does not have the dialogue, uh, but does have word cues for each piece of music. Sidebar. For some reason, um, the GNS shows, and only the GNS shows, were thoughtful enough to say, hey, what a great idea if we have the musical numbers and the dialogue, musical number, dialogue, musical number, dialogue. Um, to my knowledge, it never caught on. I think now part of it is um, the licensing agents don't want to make it too easy for anybody to buy a book and put on a show. Don't even get me started on Little Night Music, which I'm working on right now. Um, the score is missing the dialogue that is underscored in the conductor's score. Um, the dialogue has the lyrics to the songs, but some of them are part of the underscoring and then they pick up. It's impossible to do the show without Xeroxing the script and Xeroxing the conductor score um, and mixing them all up so you can go from start to finish. It drives me crazy to think that anyone that does this show has to go through the same process. Where was I? A conductor score, which I mistakenly started to refer to earlier. 
<clears throat> a conductor's score, not an orchestra score, conductor score. You would think they would be the same. They're not. A conductor score is actually a glorified piano score with markings for the conductor, indicating that this is um, a violin solo. This is where the saxophones kick in, the drum test is here, the rhythm picks up again here. For better or for worse, um, this seems to be becoming the norm as uh, newer shows seem to be more and more led by a conductor seated at a keyboard and not a stand-up conductor that you would have for something like The King and I. The synthesizer accounts for the shrinking personnel in the Broadway pit. The pit, achieving balance between the singers and the orchestra, it comes with the territory. Most of the shows written prior to the 70s were written for large orchestra to fill large pits in big Broadway houses. Singers were mostly classical trained or they were Ethel Merman. The balance was built into the orchestration. Starting in the 60s, miking started to be a thing. It was necessi necessitated by the advent of shows using amplified instruments. The rock musicals appeared on the scene. Um, so just for them to meet each other equally, everybody was miked. I find it disappointing that um, today, there are a lot of singers out there training for this as a career that are trained only on the mic, even for the only, for the only, even for the older shows with very little opportunity to sing over an orchestra with no mic. It drives me nuts. It's sad. Just saying. The clock pit is not deep, meaning that the players are closer to the level of the singers. So it's a challenge. When you encounter balance problems on these shows that were originally meant to be amplified, you have three choices. You can take instruments out of thicker sections to thin them out a little bit. You can eliminate instruments that play, that double the singer, especially if it's in the same octave. Uh, it gives them more of a fighting chance. And you can tell the orchestra to play softer or some combination of all three. Remember the clock orchestra is loudest on Monday. More about balance. The big old shows like the operettas, the Rogers and Hammersteins are written for pretty large orchestras, certainly more than the clock pit holds. If a show calls for more players than you have in the pit, you need to find some way to create a reduction of that original orchestration. Uh, you kind of tailor it to suit the complement of players that you have. Remember, there is probably no real orchestra score. To pare down a show like Carousel, traditionally involves sitting on your living room floor, surrounded by orchestra parts for four horns, two or three trumpets, three trombones, and a tuba, and reconfiguring them for the two horns, two trumpets, and one trombone that you actually have. Um, the trumpets and horns tend to have more melodic stuff. The horns also have a lot of punctuation and the trombones either have solo work or supportive bass notes, uh, or they supply a lot of the verticals in your crossword puzzle. Um, give your trombone player a book two to play from instead of book one or book three, and you'll hear an entirely different orchestra. Um, you wonder how much difference can it make? You know, triads have three notes. Occasionally, uh, there's a fancy fourth note that makes it more than a triad, um, but there's a, f a limit to how many notes those, all those, how, what was that, 10 parts are actually playing. Um, what do you do? What happens to those notes? You leave them out, you write them in. If the show were going to run for three, for six months, even six weeks, it would be clear cut. When it's running for six performances, it's a hard call. It's a lot of work. Um, it's classy if you have the time to make those differences because it really affects the sound of your show. 
um, once again, as I was writing this, I did a little Googling and what turns up but a free downloadable orchestra score, real orchestra score, of a reduced orchestration of Carousel. Clearly I was born too soon. So much has changed. For years, almost without exception, the orchestra parts were handwritten, crossed out, cuts made, rewritten, corrected. There were archeological digs uh, of the music. With the advent of computer programs, clear, clean, albeit sterile looking parts have become the norm. There are more touring versions of popular shows made for smaller ensemble floating around these days. Many conductors have also done their own reductions and guard them zealously. Surprises to be avoided. Sometimes there are different versions of scripts or even whole shows. Make sure the one you are renting is the one you think you are doing. There are, for example, five versions of Candide out there. You find that the orchestra parts do not match the vocal score. Um, things are in different order, different keys. I have three Naughty Marietta scores, all recognizably Naughty Marietta, but things are in different keys, different places. Um, it can be an adventure for your rehearsal pianist to be told, oh no, we're not doing that in F, we're doing it in E. The orchestra parts are a mess, illegible from different versions. I remember seeing a lot of sleep deprived music staff when they were trying to get the on the town parts into reasonable shape to rehearse from. Sidebar, sometimes you find the need to change the sequence of numbers. Um, sounds simple enough, but it can require an enormous amount of um, cutting and pasting, creation of inserts, paper clips, post-its. It's, it's not a simple task. If it's going to be done, it's got to be done early and before your first rehearsal. Shows often get revised for a Broadway revival. Shows get taken out, uh, shows, songs get taken out, different pieces get put in. I'm not sure why. Since, uh, since the show is now mic'd, keys get changed. You've got to know about this in advance because it can affect who you cast. Um, since they were written to be mic, uh, keys are often lower because the, I won't bore you with why, but keys are often lower and it might open the door to people with lower voices. Uh, I digress. Anyway, uh, the second time I did on the 20th century, they had eliminated the opening scene, which was a, a Joan of Arc play. It was the show that was closing. It was fun. It was cheesy. It wasn't there. We contacted the publisher and we were told, oh no, that's not available anymore. So I reconstructed it. Thank you very much. Um, even if you know that what you're looking for is sitting in a warehouse somewhere, the rental agency decides what is available to be rented. Does your show require recording something crucial in advance of the rehearsals? Um, My Fair Lady has a thing with vowels that is fun to do. It should be there ahead of time. Uh, South Pacific has a radio transmission. Pajama Game has that royal pain in the ass, hey there, which not only has to be pre-recorded, but you got to figure out how to coordinate it for all six shows. Make sure that you are aware of the need for any unusual instruments in the pit or on stage. Could be anvil, kazoo, um, ocarina, ukulele, guitar, banjo, accordion. Um, will this be one of those rare occasions where you actually do need to bring in an extra player. When I did Man of La Mancha, we had a guitarist in the pit. I was also fortunate enough to have someone in the VC who could play the guitar part on stage, which was great. We found that the percussion part was so colorful and so intense and so important to the show, we brought in a second percussionist. 
Merrily we roll along needs a working piano on stage. Make sure your tech director knows about that so that that can be accomplished in advance. Do you need a come to life portrait gallery? Me and my girl, Rutter Gore. Um, that's quite the design project and needs to be anticipated. Does your show require a gypsy violinist as one of the characters? Need not be a real gypsy, but absolutely has to be a real violinist. <clears throat> Wrapping up, this is my personal theory. I think of it as the Sweeney Todd learning curve. It's totally my very, pure speculation, but hear me out. It's 1943. It's the first day of rehearsals for Oklahoma. They hand out music, but instead of Oklahoma, it's Sweeney Todd. People turn pale, panic ensues. Oh my God, this is too hard. We have to delay the opening by three or four months so we can learn this music. Popular music, Broadway music has evolved. It has become more multi-metered, multi-layered, multi-mosaic, multi-ethnic. People are exposed to more sophisticated music than ever before. The familiar notes are there, but they come at a rapid fire pace in different combinations and different meters. The language of, oh, what a beautiful morning evolved into the language of epiphany or how much like, I can't even say it, let alone learn all that music. Uh, the language of Hamilton, um, more hot pies. Someone who once coasted through Aunt Eller and Nettie Fowler is now cramming Mrs. Lovett. We are all reaping the benefits of this. Our pores have been open. Today's performers can take difficult music, feel it kinetically and absorb it and larger doses than their predecessors. Clock. What they do at clock is not possible, but don't tell them. They've been doing it for 51 years. Thank you. On the Clock is part of our larger series, Digital Clock. Digital Clock is made possible through a generous gift from Phil and Liz Gross. If you'd like to learn more about our programming or how you can become a supporter, please visit us at collegelightoperacompany.com. Tune in again next week for another lecture in our series On the Clock.